Okay, if you want to open your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 5, as we continue to make our way through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, and as you can see, today will be part 3 of what will be, I don't know, how many part series as we go through this topic of marriage divorce, and remarriage. Uh, let's read verses 31 and 32. The words of our Lord. Jesus declared, It was said, Whoever sends his wife away, just let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people said, amen. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, all the questions I've been receiving. Today, we will actually start to answer some of those questions. We're going to answer at least one today. And I am purposely going very slowly through this section as we talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage because it is such, I mean, everything in Scripture is obviously important. But this particular topic, the topic that really has to deal with, with family, this topic is is under major attack. Actually, let me say, the family is under major attack. The institution of marriage is laughed at today. God's holy word about marriage is dismissed, disobeyed, dishonored. Man has decided that he has the right to define what a healthy, happy family is. And therefore, man says that he has the right to define what marriage is. A man even has the right to define whether or not a baby in a mother's womb should or should not live. The family unit today is under incredible attack. Obviously empowered by the evil one. The same evil one who attacked that first family back in the Garden of Eden. And how did he do it? By trying to get them to doubt the veracity, the truthfulness of God's Word. Did God really say? Come on, your God is a cosmic killjoy because he knows that if you reach for that tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, God knows that your eyes will be open and you'll just be like God. See, God doesn't want you to have freedom. God doesn't want you to be happy. God doesn't want you to enjoy your life. That's why God is restricting you. And we know what ended up happening when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the voice of the evil one rather than the voice of God. And unfortunately, we as humans continue to experience the consequences of that original sin back in the garden. Well, fast forward to today. Satan's tricks are not any different, though I do not profess to be an expert on Satan. But nevertheless, what is he doing today? Same thing he did in the garden. He is trying to get people to doubt the veracity, the truthfulness of God's word. Did God really say marriage is between one man, one woman for one lifetime? Come on. 
God is limiting your freedom. God is limiting your ability to love. Did God really say that he hates divorce? Come on. He doesn't. I mean, what kind of God is, is that that wants you to be miserable in a marriage? Come on. You have the right to your personal freedom. You have the right to your autonomy. You have the right to have your own voice. And just like that first family, listen to the wrong voice. Today, you think about how many people are listening to the wrong voice. To the point that we now have the new morality that that completely discards the truth of God and turns morality upside down, calling good that which is evil, calling evil that which is good. And the result, moral depravity everywhere. And it's poisoning the family unit. And so, We want to go nice and slow as we discuss this most vital topic. And if you recall, the last two weeks, I was kind of just laying a foundation as we took a look at three major parts of Scripture. These two verses here in Matthew 5, from Jesus preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. We then went to Matthew 19, which we'll review a little deeper today. And we connected that to Deuteronomy 24, which we really took a look at in detail last week. And we wanted to just lay a firm foundation for us. So we're starting to develop a biblical concept of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and we're not letting the culture influence us. And because I think we've laid a pretty good foundation, and today we'll add a little bit more to it, at the end of this message, we're going to have a quiz. I'm going to ask you one question. It's actually a question that came in to me. I'm going to see if you guys can answer it properly. Good deal? Well, just as a quick review, here in Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, we know that uh, our Lord was calling people to fidelity in marriage. Again, we know the religious leaders uh, were teaching a, a false view on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And that's what Jesus is addressing here in verse 31 when he said to his disciples, it was said by the religious leaders through human oral tradition. Here's their interpretation of Old Testament scripture about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It was said, whoever sends his wife away Simple. Just have the proper paperwork. You must give her that. But as long as you have the proper paperwork, you're okay. Just give her a certificate of divorce. The religious leaders back then were trying to legalize their lust. They knew that adultery was wrong. They knew from the Old Testament that the punishment for adultery is what? Was what? Being stoned to death. So the religious leader said, "Ah, how are we going to get around that? Oh, I know. If I'm in the marriage and I go with that other woman who's attractive to me, man, that's adultery. I could be killed. So what am I going to do? 
I've got to figure out a way to easily get out of this marriage. Oh, I know. Paperwork. As long as I have the paperwork. This legalizes my lust. I have the paperwork. Sorry, you're gone, honey. And now I have the freedom to pursue this woman. Do you see how devious they were? And again, as we saw last week, they were interpreting Deuteronomy 24 this way. For them, the focus was the paperwork. As long as you have that in order, you're okay. Jesus said in verse 32, uh, not quite, I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, porneia, sex with somebody else who is not your marriage partner. I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. The assumption, obviously, is that the woman who was unfairly and unbiblically kicked out of the marriage, the assumption is she's going to get remarried. In doing so, her husband, who thought, hey, all I need is the paperwork, I'm okay, he actually forces her to commit adultery. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, you who think now you're free because you just booted your wife out, um, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And so back then, you had a proliferation of adultery spreading everywhere in Israel. And it was the religious leaders who were giving the green light to this based upon their faulty, selfish, sinful interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. And unfortunately, there's nothing new under the sun today. No-fault divorce. Hey, just have the paperwork, just put irreconcilable differences, you're okay. Because God wants you to be happy. God doesn't want you to be miserable. God doesn't want you to be confined. God doesn't want you, what, to be obedient? But again, as a pastor, you have no idea how many times I've sat in front of somebody, a person who professes to be a follower of Christ. And was looking for me to affirm his or her unbiblical divorce. I need my space. I need my personal freedom. I need my autonomy. I need my voice. I need to be happy. These are the exact words that were presented to me numerous times from people who were looking for any and every way to get out of a marriage. Jesus makes it very clear here, doesn't he? Everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of porneia. That's it. Now again, this clause, uh, theologians often refer to it as the exception clause. This is not God giving us a way out of marriage. 
Again, we know God hates marriage, right? And we're going to see over the next several weeks passages in the Old Testament about that. But we do know that God, because of the hardness of our hearts, regulates divorce. Though he hates it, God hates divorce. But because of us, God had to put in regulations, very stringent regulations. Again, what a wonderful picture <laughs> of us as humans. That which God hates, divorce, he has to regulate because of us. And we see very clearly this exception clause. Though God doesn't want divorce, God will acknowledge a divorce in the case of porneia. Now again, that's not the first option. Hey, somebody could, you know, uh, as a spouse, uh, you know, you're, you, the person you're married to uh, commits adultery. Yes, that's painful. Yes, that's brutal. And yes, divorce is an option, but it's not the first option. Reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy. And again, as believers, as painful as having a spouse commit adultery, as believers who have God the Holy Spirit in us, reconciliation is always possible by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Please understand, divorce is a denial of God's will, and it is a destruction of God's work. Nowhere in Scripture does God command it or condone it, but because of sinful humans like us, God put in very stringent regulations like this one, Jesus showed. But isn't it interesting? The religious leaders, they weren't satisfied with what Jesus said here in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. So, go to Matthew 19, as we saw last week. The religious leaders decided they wanted to test Jesus on this. Again, they were looking for any and every way out. A way to legalize and justify their lust. So in verse 3, we read that some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him. And they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Well, obviously we know the answer, right? Didn't Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount, Unless, if you would divorce somebody except for Bornea, you make that other person commit adultery and you commit adultery, right? Well, religious leaders, they weren't satisfied with that. And again, as we learned the last two weeks, these religious leaders had been taught by one of the popular rabbis at that time. You guys remember his name? Rabbi? Good. Hillel. Rabbi Hillel, liberal. He interpreted Deuteronomy 24, which we studied last week. He interpreted that which God said through Moses as a command, a command to divorce as long as you have the proper paperwork. And as we studied Deuteronomy 24 last week, I think we all agree that that text was not a command for divorce. God was not commanding the husband, hey, just have the proper paperwork. Remember, we learned that that text, Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, that text hinges on a series of conditional clauses. If there's a husband and a wife, and if he wakes up and if he finds something uh, indecent in her, what's the indecency? We know it's not adultery because the punishment for adultery would have been stoning. 
So something indecent, maybe as indecent as something very vile and shameful, he discovered in her, but she hadn't committed adultery. Or maybe, to the other opposite extreme, it was something as little as, eh, I don't like the way you made my coffee today. Indecent, here's the paperwork. And so, again, think about this. Wives obviously would have been on edge in their marriage. Because they didn't know which morning it was going to be when a husband woke up and said, Up, oh, indecent, you're gone. Well, we know God hates divorce. So what did God do through Moses? He regulated the process. Nowhere does God condone a husband waking up and saying, oh, indecent, here's the paperwork, you're gone. No. How did God regulate that process back then? A process, by the way, which he found disgusting in his eyes. Well, Deuteronomy 24, the, the, the text is, a, is protection for the wife who is being unfairly, unbiblically kicked out of the marriage. She didn't commit adultery. And remember, we learned last week that the paperwork was not for the benefit of the husband. It was for the benefit and protection of the wife who was unbiblically kicked out. Remember we learned? God provided a process whereby the husbands had to write out the certificate of divorce. Not hire an attorney. And as the man was writing it out, hopefully, he was going to be able to cool off and come to his senses. What was he writing? I want the divorce. My wife did not commit adultery. She is not looking for a divorce. I release her from all obligations of being my wife. There would have been witnesses who would have signed this paper. And when the woman was kicked out of her home, her bags are packed, she's gone. This certificate of divorce was her protection against the stigma of being a divorced woman. No, 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 no. I, I'm not the one who caught. Look, look, look. The certificate. This certificate was protection for her. When it came to inevitable poverty, how was she going to support herself? Unless she was able to remarry. Well, a guy sees an attractive woman, but then goes, wait a second, you're divorced? No way. No, 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 I'm not guilty. Look, I have a certificate of divorce. Look what my former husband said. I I'm not married to him anymore. I didn't commit adultery. D do you see it? And so again, Deuteronomy 24 was not a command for divorce. It was God's warning to men about hasty decisions in filing for divorce. It was protection for women who had been kicked out of a marriage unbiblically. And it was a warning to all of Israel about how unbiblical divorces proliferate adultery everywhere. And here in Matthew 19, we see very clearly that the religious leaders, through the influence of Rabbi Hillel, they had completely mangled Deuteronomy 24. 
Again, look at the question they asked Jesus. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Well, they're looking back at what Moses said in Deuteronomy 24. Well, of course it's not lawful, right? And look how Jesus responded. Have you not read? <laughs> Hello? You're the religious leaders? You're misquoting Deuteronomy 24 to legalize your lust. Have you not read? That he, God, who created them from the beginning, made them male and female. Jesus takes them back to Genesis 1, the very beginning of the Bible. And he reminds them of the divine origins of man and woman. They were created by God, male and female. And then in verse 5, Jesus said, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus takes him to Genesis 2. The institution of marriage, which by the way, was not man's idea. It came from God. And notice what Jesus says about marriage based on Genesis 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Do you see Jesus defining the exclusivity of marriage? Man, woman. Do you see it? And the two shall become one flesh. Two wills, two spirits, two bodies become one by God's grace. A man leaves his former family not his former family, his family, which tells you the child-parent relationship, as precious as it is, it's temporary. Man's going to leave, and he's going to cleave, be glued to, stuck with <laughs> his wife, that relationship is permanent. It's a new family. Two wills, two spirits, two bodies come together as one. So Jesus here not only gives the divine origin of the creation of man and woman, he also shows the divine institution of marriage. And Jesus emphasizes its exclusivity. One man, one woman. And then Jesus in verse 6 emphasizes its permanence. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together. Let no man separate. Do you see it? We see the exclusivity of marriage and the permanence of marriage. And we see the two becoming one, cleaving, being united to the point that if one spouse hurts the other in the marriage, that spouse is actually hurting both of them. Because they're no longer two, they're one. And scripture is clear, what God has joined together, 
no man, absolutely no man can separate. So what we see here in verses 3 through 6, something very interesting. The Pharisees, they wanted to focus on divorce. Can we just go for any reason, divorce for any reason? Notice how Jesus responded to them. They want to talk about divorce? Jesus focused on what? Marriage. He took them back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The divine origin of man and woman and the divine institution of marriage. It's exclusivity and it's permanence. And again, as a pastor, I follow this example, the example of Jesus. Countless of people have come and met with me. They want out of the marriage. First thing you want to do about, talk about is divorce. They're wanting the easiest way out. And I just follow the example of our Lord. I talk to him about marriage. You see, you cannot understand God's view on, on divorce until you first clearly understand God's view on marriage. Right? And so we see how our Lord responded to them. Oh, but the Pharisees weren't fit. They weren't satisfied. Of course. So in verse 7, they said to Jesus, well, then why did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Remember Deuteronomy 24? Did Moses command that? Was that text a command for divorce? No. No. And look how Jesus responded. Verse 8, he said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, God's design, it has not been this way. Again, on the screen, verses 3 through 6, Pharisees want to talk about divorce. Jesus answers them and talks about marriage. Then verses 7 and 8, the Pharisees again completely mangled Deuteronomy 24 and said that Moses commanded divorce. Just have the proper paperwork. Jesus said, I, I, I. it wasn't a command to divorce. God through Moses, although he hates divorce, because, verse 8, of the hardness of our hearts, God had to put in regulations. So that chaos and adultery wouldn't destroy the people. Again, God doesn't command divorce. God doesn't condone divorce. But because of the hardness of our hearts, God knows. You take two sinners, you put them in a relationship, what's going to happen? Sparks are going to fly. The battle of the sexes. And in order to prevent this easy, no-fault divorce mentality, God had to put in stringent regulations. For instance, whoever divorces his wife except for pornea. Do you see it? And again, even with pornea, God still doesn't want divorce. But that's one way, one reason God will acknowledge divorce. See it? And again, these religious leaders, these hypocrites, these were the people who were supposed to be the caretakers of God's holy truth. And they were the ones who were leading people to spreading adultery everywhere. Because the religious leaders, as Jesus said time and time again, were hypocrites. And instead of interpreting God's truth, 
the way God gave the truth, they instead twisted and turned God's truth, like Martin Luther said, making God's truth like a waxed nose and just twisting it and turning it whichever way you want. And do you see how they misinterpreted Deuteronomy 24? And then Jesus says in verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, this is the second time he says it, Matthew, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, porneia, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Again, I think it's pretty clear, the religious leaders, when it came to marriage and divorce, what was their attitude? They were flippant. Whatever. Can we just get out for any and every reason? They had no respect for the institution of marriage. They were flippant. But look at Jesus' attitude towards marriage and divorce. Jesus was very, very serious. Where he said, you divorce your wife for any reason, except for porneia, adultery. And how serious was Jesus on this? Look at the response of his disciples. Verse 10, they said to him, well, if a relationship with man and his wife is like this, i.e., this serious, <laughs> they said, it's better not to marry. And Jesus said in verse 11, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it's been given. The gift of celibacy comes from God. It cannot be forced upon man, right? And so, we see very clearly our Lord's attitude when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We see very clearly the religious leaders and their attitude when it came to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And Jesus made it very clear. The only acceptable reason for divorce in God's eyes is adultery. Are we clear on that? Now, we're going to learn a little bit more today. That's why we interpret Scripture with other Scripture. Because we're going to see today that Scripture tells us that in addition to adultery, there are two other reasons where God will accept divorce and remarriage. Okay? One of the reasons is death. Death of one of the spouses. Go to Romans chapter 7. Verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes it very clear. For the married woman, and again, he's talking to believers here, right? He's writing to the church in Rome. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, no Michaela you cannot kill John, all right? If her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. Well, that makes sense. It was a covenant of companionship. First of all, and foremost, a covenant before God, but also a covenant of companionship with each other. Well, if one of the spouses dies, that covenant's been broken, not because of sin, but because you know, the spouse died. Well, what happens to the surviving spouse? Are they stuck? I mean, are they allowed to? Do they have to still, like, you know, uh, act and live the rest of their lives of those that are still married to that person, even though that person's dead? Paul says no, verse 3. So then if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. We understand that, right? Echoing the words of our Lord. But... If her husband dies, she is free from the law 
so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Question. Two believers in a marriage. One of the believing spouses dies. The surviving believer, is he or she allowed to get remarried? Yeah, it says it right here, right? She's not an adulteress. Though she's joined to another man. Again, ladies, I'm telling you, this is not... A, I know how you modern-day Pharisees are. Okay, if I kill him, then I can... No, you can't do that, all right? <laughs> oh, by the way, God even regulates that. Go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. Again, the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth. And look what he says about this. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. We get that, right? But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. But finish the sentence. Only in the Lord. In other words, that surviving, believing spouse can get remarried, but only to another believer. Do you see it? So, God says in his word that the surviving spouse is no longer bound in the marriage because his or her spouse died. Which means that surviving spouse can get remarried, but only to a believer. All right? Now, what about if you've got two unbelievers married and God in His grace ends up saving one of those people. Suddenly, you now have a marriage where there's one believer and one unbeliever. They didn't go into the marriage unequally yoked. They were both unbelievers going into the marriage. But once they're married, God in His grace saves one of them. And so now you have a marriage that is unequally yoked, but not because somebody sinned there. It's because God in His grace saved one the other one's not safe. What do you do there? Well, here in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul deals with that. Hop over to verse um, 13. Paul says, And a woman who has an unbelieving husband. Stop there. Think of our context here. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. Corinth in the southern part of Greece, in the region of Achaia. Corinthians, pagans, right? And Corinth was a long ways off away from Jerusalem. Well, as the gospel started to be spread in Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, throughout Israel, and then out of Israel throughout the Mediterranean... This very example was inevitably going to occur. Paul would go preach the gospel, right? Two unbelievers in a marriage, one gets saved, right? Now what? Well, Paul addresses that. A woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her. He wants to remain in the marriage. Even though she's a follower of Christ, even though she worships Christ, even though she lives her life to honor Christ, if he wants to stay in the marriage, Paul says, she must not send her husband away. She must not divorce him, right? And Paul gives one of the benefits. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified, blessed, a recipient of God's grace through 
his wife. I mean, you think about it. Every home, every family where there's a believer, God's grace is poured out on that believer and through that believer to the point that even the unbelieving husband is a recipient of that flow of grace, right? Doesn't mean he's going to be saved, but he's actually being blessed. And the unbelieving wife, in like manner, is sanctified through her believing husband. But not just that. Talk about the children. Paul says, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. And so when God in his grace regenerates somebody in the family, the, rem the rest of the family experiences benefits and blessings because of that, right? The unbelieving spouse and even the children. That's why Paul was saying, hey, as a believer, if as long as your unbelieving spouse wants to stay in the marriage, there's a benefit. Keep praying for your unbelieving spouse. Be an example of Christ before your unbelieving spouse. Share the gospel of Christ with your unbelieving spouse. And oh, by the way, don't think that it's all bad because God's grace to you goes through you and flows into your family, right? And who knows what God will do with that? Maybe he'll save them as well. But, verse 15, if the unbelieving one leaves, uh, in the Greek, the tense of that word leaves is in the present, meaning that the unbeliever has already started the process of leaving, divorcing, and is continuous, continuing that process, right? In our modern day language, he would have hired a lawyer. Okay? Paul says, if the unbelieving spouse leaves, is continuously showing that he or she does not want to remain in the marriage, look at the command to the believer. Let him leave. Again, leave in that part is also continuous in the present. So let him continue to do what he's doing. Now, listen. Paul's not talking about the believing spouse forcing the unbeliever out. Paul's talking about an unbeliever wanting out. Regardless of how the believing spouse is representing Christ, the unbeliever wants out because he hates Christ. Paul says, let him go. And look what he says. The believer, brother or sister, is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. Okay? And so, we see in the scriptures where God will acknowledge as a biblical divorce if there's adultery in the marriage. Again, divorce is not the first option. We want to seek healing and reconciliation where possible. Second way, God will acknowledge remarriage of a believer is if there's death of a spouse. Third way God will acknowledge a divorce is if there is abandonment by the non-believer. And let me tell you, people have tried to <laughs> come up with all kinds of ingenious ways to define abandonment. Well, my husband has abandoned the marriage. Well, how did your husband abandon the marriage? Um, he does nothing but watch football on Sundays. That's abandonment? Yeah, that's emotional abandonment. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
I actually had somebody say that to me. Um, you know, um, my husband's abandoned the marriage. He works too long and he's at the gym too long. Was there any pornea? No, not that I'm aware of. But he's an unbeliever and he's abandoned the marriage. Whoa, whoa, just because he works too long and goes to the gym too long. I'm not saying it's right that he does that, but again, we as humans, because the hardest of our hearts, we are always trying to widen, right? The regulations. Again, isn't that what the Pharisees and scribes did? <laughs> so don't be a modern day Pharisee or scribe. <laughs> All right. All right, so this is pretty clear, right? And so today we did some review and we added a few more blocks to our understanding. You guys ready for a quiz? Remember the last two weeks we talked about how the church is very confused about this idea of marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Remember we took a look at the four major views and we also know there's only one correct view, God's view? Well, based upon what you've learned the last few weeks, let's now take a quiz. First view, uh, where, where Christians will say divorce and remarriage, no way, no how, under any circumstances. Based upon what you've learned these last few weeks, would you agree with that view? So, fair to say we X out that view. Everybody okay with that? Good. All right. Let's go to view two. Again, unfortunately, we're talking about in the Christian church here. View two. They'll teach that divorce and remarriage is permitted under any and every circumstance. God wants me to be happy. God wants me to fulfill my potential. God wants me to find my own voice, my own freedom, my autonomy. Do we agree with that one? Yes or no? Good. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs down? Yeah, because isn't this what the Pharisees were saying, right? The exact thing. So we're going to X out number two as well, right? All right, let's make it a little bit tougher now. View three. Divorce, people will say, is permitted under certain circumstances. Again, they'll agree adultery, death, or abandonment of the non-believer. But these people will say that remarriage is never, ever permitted. Do we agree with that or do we disagree with that? Very good. And my brother, the light bulb went off at the earlier service on that, huh? But again, I want to be fair to you. Let's not move you all the way over yet. But at least as we're building, and that's the goal here. You start to see truth and you see it interpreted with other scriptures. You go, aha. So good. This is good. Our goal is not, you know, to prove that I'm right because it's not about me. It's about God's word. The goal is that together we discover God's word on this, right? So on this view here, divorce is permitted under certain circumstances. But when they say remarriage is never permitted, we thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs down. Very good. X that out. Fourth view. Divorce and remarriage is permitted under certain circumstances regulated by God and not our feelings and emotions. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up. Very good. All right. Well, since you all now are such experts... <laughs> on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I'm telling you, very good. You guys, you guys did well. Um, and next week, we'll build some more, okay? Let's do this. Let's address a question that I received. And it's funny. All the questions I get, right? They all start out with this, these two words. What about? <laughs> what about? Okay, what about? Religious annulment. You guys know what annulment is? Annulment is both in the secular and religious realm. Uh, an annulment basically is a cancellation of a prior marriage. It's not a divorce. The marriage and probably divorce have already occurred. An annulment is 
is basically canceling that marriage and divorce out as though it never existed. Basically, that marriage or marriages, that divorce or divorces have been deemed null and void. Now, this morning, I googled uh, annulment, and the first thing that popped up, I thought it was going to be, you know, annulment as defined by the Catholic and Orthodox Church, but instead, (laughs) the first thing that popped up was an advertisement from some secular organization that said, and I quote, For $139, you can receive your complete paperwork for an annulment within 30 minutes. And it gets even better. We guarantee 100% court approval in getting your annulment or you get all your money back. as though the marriage never existed. Now, that's in the secular world. I mean, think about how enterprising pagans are. (laughs) They'll figure out ways to make money on even that which God has instituted and ordained, marriage. And I have to tell you, more and more Christians, or let me say it this way, more and more people who profess to be believers are going to organizations like that. Why? Because if they're part of a strong church that clearly understands what Scripture says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, well, they're not going to get the answer they want. So you know what they do? I don't need the church. I'll pay $139, and I get a guarantee, or I get my money back. But look, we understand stuff like this from the secular, non-believing, non-biblical society. But notice a religious annulment. I don't know if you're aware that both the Catholic and Orthodox churches, church, churches, both claim that their religious hierarchy has the right has the power, has the keys from Christ to grant religious annulments. To basically wipe out as though it never existed previous marriages and divorces. In fact, the Catholics call it a declaration of nullity. Again, it's not a dissolution, uh, it's not a divorce, it's not breaking a marriage apart. We're talking about something in the past that the church says has the power to erase it and make it null and void. You're aware here in our country of some famous people who have had religious annulments. Ted Kennedy, from his first wife, Joan. Joseph Kennedy, from his wife, Sheila. Pay enough money to the religious institution. They can make anything go away. Now, again, both Catholics and Orthodox claim that religious hierarchy has this power, though they differ in kind of their 
methodology on it. But the Catholic Church, for, you know, years upon years, I mean, this, this all started way, way back when, right? And you do understand that's not in the Bible. But the Catholic Church actually tried to protect this process a little bit by saying that they needed to have two separate tribunals examine a particular case. And if these two separate tribunals agreed, then an annulment would be granted, obviously, by the Pope, right? Well, in 2015, the Pope, Pope Francis, actually widened that to allow um, maybe a more lax approach to annulment, obviously with the goal of trying to get as many people to return to the Catholic Church as possible. And so you've got, throughout this world, people who have paid, both in the secular and the religious realm, they've paid to have their previous marriage or marriages, divorce or divorces, made null and void, as though they never happened. But wait a second. Children came out of those relationships. If there was no marriage, if it never happened, how do you explain the children? And so I guess here's my question. What about a religious annulment? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, some of you guys got aggressive on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had the lights go off. God, the Holy Spirit, that's why I say illuminate somebody at our last service who blurted out and says, no, annulment's okay. What? And I reminded the congregation saying, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 19? What God has joined together? No one. Absolutely no one can tear apart. Right? No human institution, no religious institution has the right, has the power, or has the authority from God to make a marriage disappear. What God has brought together No one can tear apart. But think about how dangerous this is. Especially when it comes to popular wealthy people. Hey, I end up getting married. Not a big risk because if I get a divorce, I'll just give enough money to the church and they'll make it go away as though it never happened. Is that what Jesus taught? I mean, look at the flippant attitude today, like the Pharisees back then, towards marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so, you guys all got, I, what I, obviously, biblically, <laughs> the correct answer here. Next week, we're going to take a look at another question. What about a violent spouse? Great question. Again, I've had to deal with that several times. Can that spouse who's the victim of violence file for divorce? We'll also take a look at this question. What about a loser spouse? <laughs> now, I have to be honest with you. Both of these questions came very gender specific. What about a violent husband? What about a loser husband? <laughs> As though that's the only gender, okay, that can do that. So I, I kind of made it more equal, right? <laughs> that's my full disclosure.
So we're going to address those two questions next week and several more as we continue to build on this foundation, okay? Now, as I conclude, as I did the last few times, I, I just want to remind all of us, look, perhaps your view of marriage and divorce and remarriage had been drastically different than our Lord's view, the biblical view. And as a result, perhaps you went into a marriage you shouldn't have gone into. You left a marriage that you shouldn't have left. You remarried when you shouldn't have. And maybe you're sitting there going, huh, I left a trail of adultery, disobedience. Yes, that is sin. Yes, that goes against God's clear commands. But as I said last week, as heinous as those sins are, they're not the unpardonable, unforgivable sins. There's grace, there's mercy, there is forgiveness through Christ. For those who truly repent and for those who truly put their faith and trust in Christ. Look, the Bible is very clear. When you are saved by Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. You have a new mind, a new heart, a new will, new desires. You're a new creation in Christ. And you know what our Lord does? He's the one. Who takes your sins from the past and makes them disappear. And only he has the right and authority to do it. And think about the cost he paid. For your sins. And mine. God the Son. The second person of the Trinity. Humbling himself. And taking on the form of man. living among sinners, coming to save sinners like you and me. Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law for us in our place. And then he went to the cross and as he hung there, you see the demonstration of God's love towards us and God's justice towards our sins. Yes, God is love, and yes, God is a savior, but God is also a just judge. He cannot ignore our sins. I don't care how much people pay to a secular or religious institution to try to make their sins of the past go away. They don't go away. God sees them, God knows them, and God has to punish those sins. And so at the cross, God demonstrated his love towards us. How? He didn't punish us with the punishment we deserve. Instead, God raised up a substitute, his beloved son who was punished in our place for our sins. It's God's love towards us. But God also demonstrated his perfect justice 
He didn't ignore our sins. He didn't compromise. Had he done that, he wouldn't be God. You know what God did? He punished our sins. But he didn't punish us, the sinners. He punished the sinless one, his beloved son in our place. You see God's love towards us, God's justice towards our sins. You see the infinite wisdom of God? God's wrath was poured out on Jesus in our place. Jesus died, but three days later, he rose in victory. He overcame sin and death for us. And through Christ, you have forgiveness of sins. Through Christ, you are a new creation in Christ. Through Christ, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone. And those who have repented of their sins, those who have cried out to Jesus, begging him for mercy and grace, forgiveness and eternal life, those who have been made new by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, watch me. All your sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for in full. To the point where God looks at you, Christian, and says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so, if you haven't yet trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? He's the only Savior. Cry out to him and beg him to be your savior. It's a gift of grace. We don't deserve it. Look at the cost he paid for us. And as a new creation in Christ, you want to now live your life in gratitude. For, for what Christ has done for you. And so together, as we study the scriptures, and together we desire to submit to God's holy truth, out of gratitude for what God has done for us, as we together study the scriptures and desire to obey the Lord and to live for the glory of the Lord, you're going to see many of those things that you used to think about marriage, divorce, and remarriage and other things, you're going to go, whoa, this is what God says. I want to obey God. And so, Christian, if you made some bad decisions, sinful decisions, Before you knew Christ, before you knew the word of Christ, Christian, the good news is you are a new creation in Christ. Yeah, there are still going to be some earthly consequences, some stuff that still flows from those bad decisions, but as we're going to learn over the next several weeks, there are ways that you can even bring healing to those things. And remember, in Christ... Your sins are paid for in full in terms of judgment. And now, learn His truth and the power of the Spirit. Live His truth and desire to bring glory and honor to your Savior. It's not going to be easy. There are going to be times where your emotions want you to do that which you think is best for you. We all go through that. But we all know that's not the right way. And so together, as we continue this series, 
May God grant grace to all of you to be able to trust the Lord by His Spirit and through the power of His Word to transform you more and more into the image of Christ.